Hallelujah. Well, it's good to be here in Snellville, Georgia. And didn't we have a time last night? I was so delighted to be here. Ken did an awesome job ministering. He really has become one of my best friends. And, um, you know, it was so encouraging to have people come up to us last night. Had a couple come up to me and say, you know, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And I've gone to church my whole life. So those are the kind of things that we want people to walk away with. And it's not to bring glory to self. It's not to glorify a man or to cause people to be impressed with us. I learned a long time ago, if you preach for a response for the people, then you'll always need the affirmation of the people. Everything we do is for him and is to please him. And um, I was so encouraged last night by the uh, response, you guys being open to the prophetic. And, you know, I've learned to discern when I go in certain places, just the atmosphere, can, you can discern to see if people are open, if they're shut off. And, uh, you know, I don't, uh, we all know in part, remember? We see in part. So there's parts I don't see that may not be given in the word, but that's where you learn to hear the word in the word. You're listening for him. You know, you might have your favorite preachers, your favorite speakers, and though, you know, some you might think, well, you know, they're not my favorite, they're uh, boring or whatever, but here's what I've, I've learned. If whoever's speaking, okay, detach the personality from that and ask the Lord, to help you to be able to hear him in the word, to hear the word, the living word, the word which was with God from the beginning that was made flesh. We want to hear the word in the word. And that's why two people can walk away with two totally different truths that were melded to their hearts. So I think Ken's coming up and we're going to do a uh, answer question. I'm looking forward to speaking tonight. Um, Let's move this out of the way here so there's no obstruction. One of the things that uh, I have learned as well over the years in the prophetic is some people, you know, and, and by the way, I do believe in the fear of the Lord. I had a great revelation teaching on the fear of the Lord, but, you know, God does have a sense of humor. Yeah, it's hard for people to believe that, but, you know, Psalms 2 tells us the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. So he can laugh, and, you know, and it's not just at the folly of the wicked, but I call it the divine pun, okay? Just like last night, Deuteronomy 33 in those first nine verses spoke, I mean, several um, Names and details described a family's life. That's God weaving just from Scripture. I didn't say anything. I just read the Bible, and it was a prophetic word. And then at that point, you have the responsibility to say, okay, this was given to me. This was a seed. Now I have to discover that. And that, a lot of people misunderstand the prophetic. They think, well, I just got a word, so that means everything should happen. No, you got to war that. Because now the, the revelation has been given and you've received it, the enemy's going to come in with doubt. He's going to come in with fear. He's going to come in with uncertainty. You know what spiritual warfare is, in my opinion? Spiritual warfare is when you, through a prophetic voice or through prayer or uh, hearing from the Lord yourself, you get third heaven revelation. Okay? And it's all about third heaven revelation coming from that realm into this realm, into earth and time. But do you know between the third heaven and the earth, the third heaven being the place where God dwells, where uh, his throne is, the, where uh, Paul spoke of, said, I knew a man in Christ 14 years ago, sent into the third heaven. Between here, where prayer is answered and manifested and healings and deliverances and all of that happens between here and that third heaven is a second heaven where angels and demons war. And so you understand Daniel goes on a 21 day fast. Remember? And the angel comes to him afterwards and says, Daniel, 
you were heard on day one. But the prince of Persia withstood me. And he literally says, and I'm paraphrasing it, but he said, I, basically, I called for reinforcements. Extra angelic assistance came and helped him press through that third heaven answer, through that second heaven where angels and demons war, where Michael and the archangel are fighting. See, this is just my opinion. It's if, if I share this with you uh, and the pastor sees it different, he's right, I'm wrong, okay? <laughs> but I really feel that way. But, but see, this is what I believe. People look at the Bible and they're like, well, you know, it seems to say in Isaiah and Ezekiel that uh, Lucifer was cast out of heaven. So how's he in heaven in Revelation? Well, you have to understand, he was cast out of the third heaven before time began. Remember, he said, I will ascend my throne above the throne of God. I believe this is in Isaiah 14. Uh, and I think it's talked about in, 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 in 28 as well. And so he... Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, excuse me. So he lost that place with God in the third heaven, and so he was demoted, and he was cast down to the earth, but he still had access to the second heaven, even, to the, in, even when you get in the book Revelation. That's where it says, you know, that, that Michael, the archangel, and the dragon warred in heaven, and then it says Satan was cast down down with great wrath knowing he has but a short time that's why the time of the great tribulation will be such a time like there's never been as the bible says before this time or hereafter because think about it if the devil lost the third heaven before genesis <laughs> and he's going to lose the second heaven here sometime soon and all of his energy is going to be concentrated on the earth that's why it's going to be hell on earth for a while but when Jesus returns, he gets his eviction notice here as well, and he's bound and cast in the bottomless pit. So, I mean, the guy just keeps going down, down, down. He, he, he lost the third heaven. He's going to lose the second heaven, and then he's going to lose the earth, and God's going to get that back, and there's going to be a 1,000 years of peace. So, guys, that's good news. But that's why you have to warfare over prophetic revelation, third heaven revelation that comes from God, because there are demons that want to affect your faith, get you in doubt, and hinder that angel from getting that answer that you heard. Your, your prayer was heard day one, but 21 days of prayer and fasting, there was a battle between the third heaven and Daniel's earth. Does that make sense? Anyways. I was just sitting here laughing, thinking a really good sermon title would be Circling the Drain, referring to where Satan is... <laughs> Where he's going. It's like ministering to the John. It's a circle. That one drink. too, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, so the other thing the other thing that's probably worth noting here, um, consistent with what Chris is saying, is that Daniel passage is one of the most, I would say, mistaught because it's misunderstood, uh, mistaught passages in the Bible as it pertains to spiritual warfare. Because people take that passage to mean this is not what it means. I'm about to tell you what people think it means. And the reason I'm stopping and clarifying that is, I don't know what it is, but in the last month, everywhere I've gone, people hear what I didn't say. And then they don't hear what I am saying. So I'm stopping to say, pay attention, because I'm about to tell you something you aren't, you aren't expecting to hear, a lot of you, and you'll miss it, and then you'll come up and say, wait, did you say, no, I didn't say that. So I'm going to say what I'm going to say. So in the Daniel 7 passage, what we have is, uh, is it Daniel 7? I think it's right. Yeah, Daniel 7. Um, in that passage is not Daniel engaging in strategic level spiritual warfare. Daniel is not engaging principalities. Okay? That is not happening in the passage. I know you've heard teachers say that, but that's not what's going on. Daniel prays and immediately Gabriel is dispatched to bring the answer to him. And then Gabriel runs into resistance from the prince of Persia. Daniel's not engaging the prince of Persia. He's just on the earth fasting and praying. And his prayers are enabling the angels to do what they do. And Gabriel runs into so much opposition, he can't get through. 
So when he, when he runs into trouble, it appears from the way the text is written, Gabriel asks for reinforcements, which is what Chris just said. And now Michael is dispatched. So in, um, it, this is not all in the Bible, but it's in the Apocrypha, which the Catholics include as part of their Bible. So maybe on this one, the Catholics are a little bit ahead of us. Um, but anyway, in the Apocrypha, <clears throat> which includes some books that are, to us, not in the canon of Scripture, and there was a big debate about this when Luther was leading the Reformation. Should we include the Apocrypha? Should we not? Um, in the Apocrypha, it says there are four archangels. Four. Four archangels. One is Michael. One is Gabriel. And for those who are curious, the other two are uh, Raphael and Uriel. Raphael is the angel of healing. The one that stirred the water at the pool of Bethesda among other things, followed Branham around. Um, and the other one is Uriel, the angel of fire. So for those who are wondering. Now again, those last two names, you won't find them in the 66 books that we use in the Protestant Bible. You've got to go to the Apocrypha, which is the Catholic Bible, to get those last two names. But uh, Gabriel and Michael, they are in our Protestant Bible. So Michael is the commander of the armies of heaven, and he's the one who deals with the Prince of Persia, not Daniel. So what does this have to do with you as prophets in training? Well, a lot of prophets get tangled up in trying to take on these high-level principalities, or you'll hear people say, we're engaging in high-level warfare. That's usually a dangerous place to be, usually. Now, I have a way of explaining this, and many of you know me well enough from my previous visits. Uh, you know that... I often use military metaphors, and I think it's appropriate, actually, because the kingdom of heaven is at war with the kingdom of darkness. There is actually a war going on. So we think by analogy here, this isn't literal, but <clears throat> think of the U.S. Navy. In the Navy, there are a lot of fine individuals and a few scoundrels, uh, but mostly fine individuals who are trying to serve their country well, and it depends on their class of service. Some of them may be I don't know, they might be servicing aircraft on an aircraft carrier, but they don't fly planes. They work on planes in the hangar deck. Or maybe they're working on the flight deck, launching planes. Or they're working on the bridge, and they're involved with steering the ship, navigation, communications, things like that. Some are cooks. They're literally feeding all the people on the ship. Or whatever. We have ship's doctors. We've got weapons officers. We've got all kinds of stuff. Then we've got, uh, as I said, pilots, and not everybody who's a pilot flies fighters and gets to be in Top Gun. Some of them are flying helicopters, and they drop sono buoys and hunt submarines. It's not particularly glamorous, but it's important work. And so on and on and on. We could talk about all these different things that people in the Navy do. And then we've got the people who get all the marketing dollars, and they're known as the Navy SEALs. And everybody knows that they're cool and they're, I can't really use a word that I want to use in front of a crowd in a church, but you know, they're the bad guys, right? They're, but they're the good guys who are the bad guys. And um, so when you, when you think you've located Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad, Pakistan, did anyone see O Dark 30 or Zero Dark 30? Nobody in this room saw the move. Okay. Are you guys awake? Let's get up and do jumping jacks. So in that movie, did they send a fighter pilot in to deal with Obama? Or no, Obama. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> Woo! Did they send in a fighter pilot to deal with Osama bin Laden? <laughs> no, they didn't. Did they send in the cook to deal with Osama bin Laden? No, they didn't. Did they send in a weapons officer? No. Helicopter pilot? No. The guy who steers the ship? No, 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 no. There was a specialized group that they sent in called SEAL Team 6. They're dedicated anti-terrorism. That's all they do. And we're not just talking like, you know, bad boys in Snellville, Georgia. We're talking guys like Osama bin Laden. They're well-armed. They're basically a military under themselves. 
And when you need to solve that problem, you need SEAL Team 6. And uh, <clears throat> can we just say that if you put SEAL Team 6 on the bridge of an aircraft carrier or a destroyer, that would be its own problem. That's not what they're trained to do. They are trained to engage in direct battle with the baddest of the bad guys. And when you send them in, everybody on our side comes home alive. And all the bad guys are buried at sea. That's what happened in Abbottabad. They flew the body of bin Laden and a few of his bodyguards out to the aircraft carrier. They put them in body bags and they gave them a burial at sea so their bodies would never be found. That's what happened. So when you need somebody to engage in that kind of strategic level spiritual warfare, you need the equivalent of SEAL Team 6. And there aren't that many people in the world that are trained and equipped to do that. And generally, if you are called to it, you know that you're called to it. So guys like Omar Cabrera from the Argentine Revival, he did it. Um, Pete Wagner, when he was alive, he did it. Cindy Jacobs seems to have a grace on her life for this. Rebecca Greenwood does. But there's not hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I don't, I don't know how many are on SEAL Team 6, but I, I know people in the Navy. It's not that many. It's, it's maybe a couple of hundred people at the most. They're very guarded about even giving those numbers out. So there are some who are called to that kind of engagement, but mostly when you're in the realm of intercession, you pray, ask God for the breakthrough, continue to ask him to provide angels, and your prayers provide strength and aid to the angels. The angels are dispatched on our account to help us here on the earth. But for most people, they're better on the bridge, serving in mess, fueling the planes, arming the weapons, hunting for mines and submarines, but not necessarily engaging in direct battle with the terrorists in Abbottabad. Does that make sense? It's an extended metaphor. And so um, the one thing I will say as a qualifier to that, or maybe a clarifier, use an example like that <clears throat> in human flesh being what it is, human nature being what it is, people immediately want to say, I'm called to be one of them. I'm one of them. And so there's, there's an immediate pride response. Watch out, pride will take you out. Pride cometh before a fall. So even if you are on SEAL Team 6 in this example, um, that doesn't mean you're better than other people. It means you have differential training God's given you gifting to commensurate with the calling, but you aren't necessarily better. You're just different. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think it's important, too, to recognize, you know, this, this whole business of commanding angels, I'm not into that. Uh, you know, the Bible says that the angels give heed to the voice of God's word. Mm -hmm. And so we don't pray to angels they can initiate com communication with you. But what I've often found in regards to um, spiritual warfare in the context which we're, we're speaking of, uh, and you remember there, that passage in Daniel, the angel said when he said, I went back for reinforcements and got Michael, uh, that he was facing resistance from uh, the prince of Persia. Sorry. Now that doesn't mean, um, let, let me break this down. So it's not saying the human ruler was doing combat with uh, this angel. It was the power behind the That's throne, right. so to speak. It was the principality, and I believe there are levels of just like you, you brought up the example of the military, there's rank in the military, mm -hmm. okay? And since the, the Lord, you know, the captain of the Lord's host, we know that there are principalities, powers, and mights, and dominions. All of those, just like there are archangels, there's angels, there's guardian angels. Uh, I believe that, that Lucifer copycatted, just as he often does, uh, everything that he has a counterfeit to everything that, that is real. The devil can, can cause someone to speak in tongues. I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, he has a counterfeit to the real, but if there's a counterfeit, that means there is a real. 
But the point that I'm making is, is Daniel didn't engage and take on the principality himself. Um, you know, I think of the passage in Jude where I'm trying to remember the Bible character. It might have been Moses, but where the statement was made where, where Michael, the archangel himself, didn't take on. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And so this business of people uh, taking on principalities, and principalities are regional strongholds, high-level, higher-ranking demons. Here's what I think. In Genesis 6, when the sons of God came down, there was an attempt for the fallen angels that fell with Lucifer, a third of them. That means they're still two-thirds with God. Uh, but a third of them fell with Lucifer, and they uh, were cast into the earth. That's how the serpent ends up in Eden. Uh, you were in Eden, it says in Ezekiel or Isaiah. I keep mixing those two up. Um, and covered in every stone and so on and so forth. But, but even in that verse, a king was being addressed, a physical human king was being addressed by a prophet, but he was speaking to the spirit that was influencing, empowering that king. Now, so a prince, a palatee, or a prince in the palace is this, high-ranking demons. I believe after the Tower of Babel, when human, humanity spread over the face of the earth into different uh, geographies, different places, parts of the world, that as we study history, history will tell us this. That's where you hear a lot of the ancestral narratives, okay? Not just of, of the, the Celts or the Anglo-Saxons, but also uh, in Africa, in South America. Uh, the pagan worship of pagan gods. These pagan gods, quotation, little g, pagan gods that they were worshiping of their culture. And those, those, they were actually demons, okay? High-level demons posing as gods that all of our ancestors in somewhere in history were worshiping. And you know what those demons were doing? They were latching on to certain people group, certain ethnicities, certain cultures in certain geographical regions and entrench themselves there. And so all of human history is a depiction of warfare over one stronger nation or tribe or empire that overcome another nation or empire and force that nation or people group or ethnic group uh, to abandon their culture and worship their God. So even the demons were fighting for territory and supremacy on the earth. And so we've seen that in all ancestral narratives. The, the, the pagan gods were actually demons posing as gods that were being worshipped and they were influencing the kings and rulers, and still to this day are, of those nations to try to further advance the satanic agenda for that geography. And that's why it says in Matthew 24, in the last days, one of the signs that we're coming to the end of the age and the soon second coming bodily return of the Lord Jesus Christ, nation will rise against nation. That word nation is ethnos, meaning ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. Isn't it interesting how over the last few years, racism of all kinds has resurfaced even here in America? Okay, but this all goes way back to when people started spreading over the face of the earth and claiming territory and demons or the gods of those would appear to those ancestors and form a culture, form a religion, and then we would see uh, you know, known powers of the world like Greece or Persia at various times or Rome, they would advance and control parts or if not the whole known world for a season, okay? And so the gods of that empire, 
that overthrew all the other ones became the gods that everyone was forced to worship. And that's what you saw when, when the Jews were taken into Babylonian captivity, if you remember, and they were trying to force the Jews to bow down and worship the image in Babylon. And remember, uh, Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego refused. They would not bow. And so they went back after 70 years to Jerusalem and refound their Jewish or Hebrew culture that tied in with that was the worship of their God, the one true God, the God of Israel. So the, the whole of human history, the whole of human, uh, or rather spiritual warfare, is Jesus is coming back, and he's not coming back to take sides. He's coming back to take over. And when, he's, when he comes back, all of these regional uh, geographic principalities, just like the principality of Persia that withstood the angel from bringing the answered prayer to Daniel, that was the demon or the prince in the palace, the principality in that region that was trying to hinder the work of God. This is why I have found as I travel and speak, of course, I'm pretty busy in Fort Mill, South Carolina at Morningstar, but I, I get out and travel at least once, one weekend a month somewhere, and I've noticed when I go to different states or even have been into different nations, um, not nothing like Ken has, but I feel a different atmosphere or different feeling or different opposition that can affect you physically, spiritually, emotionally in different ways. And what you're feeling is there is a predominant spiritual force entrenched within the geography and the people of that region that you've come up against. But the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And Jesus said, in my name, they'll cast out demons. In my name, they'll lay hands on the sick, they'll recover, they'll speak with new tongues. So this is why when the Bible said Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand, demons would respond or manifest. You know what was happening? Jesus was bringing the kingdom of God back to the earth. The heavens of the heavens of the, is the Lord's, but the earth he gave to the sons of men. The sons of men gave it to Satan, and ever since then, Satan has dispersed demons in geographical regions of the earth to try to get people to fight in warfare and destroy each other, kill each other, plunder each other, enslave each other, uh, and all people groups are guilty. Okay? I hate to say it, but let's just be real and be honest. All right? Uh, whites have held slaves. Native Americans have had slaves. Africans have had slaves. All people groups have been guilty, so that's why we all must come to the foot of the cross. Amen. Okay? Uh, that's the only way this is ever going to be made right is radical forgiveness and equal freedom and justice, which is why America is worth fighting for. But let me finish with this, and then I'll, I'll stop. But when he came preaching the kingdom of heaven, demons would manifest. What was happening? He was disturbing the entrenched demons or principalities of that region. So when we go into the world and preach the gospel and demons manifest and deliverance happens, like Ken's ministry is, is he had, he's the strongest deliverance. He was, he was the deliverance ministry before deliverance ministry was cool. <laughs> he he was the deliverance minister before come out in Jesus' name, hit the theaters. Okay? Uh, you guys get that, right? So so that's what it is. When deliverance is really preaching the kingdom of God and saying, nope, we're taking ground. That's right. We're preaching the kingdom of God. The earth is the Lord's. Jesus is getting his earth back. He's got the title deed to the earth, and we're his ambassadors. We're kingdom ambassadors. And even though we'll not fully finish the job until he returns and does it himself, we're supposed to influence culture and do everything we can in developing our gifts, the prophetic deliverance, and the pro prophetic partners with deliverance, it partners with healing. And we unseat entrenched demons in people groups and in regions when we preach the kingdom of God because 
God is bringing his domain, his kingdom, his king domain, the king's domain, kingdom of God on the earth, and demons will react because they don't want to give up ground. Amen. So a couple clarifying points. He and I both said Daniel 7. It's Daniel 9 is the passage, so both of us were off, but... Uh, Daniel 9 verse 20 while I was speaking and praying confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God so he's interceding for the temple mount and he's interceding on behalf of the nation of the Jews while I was speaking in prayer the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the first he'd had an earlier vision where Gabriel appeared to him um, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. So towards dusk, he made me uh, understand, speaking to me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your plea for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, and you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And so this is where we get the, the language of the, um, the conflict be in the heavens between uh, the angelic host led by Michael, the archangel. And it, the story goes on. I'm just not reading all of it. But anyway, Daniel 9 is your proper addressing. And then when Chris was talking about this idea of the gods of the nations or demons, that's, that's a concept that is biblical. But if you've had any kind of traditional Bible upbringing, you probably were never told this. And if you've been drinking the Kool-Aid that's put out by the mainstream media, um, the organs of mainstream culture, such as the universities or the public school system or anywhere else, all religions are equally good, according to that teaching. I'm not saying that. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Um, all religions are equally good, and so as long as you have a religion, it's okay, but don't get too excited about it. Don't be too devoted. Don't be too over the top here. Everything needs to be decent and in order. Uh, but, you know, Hindus and Muslims and Christians, you guys are all basically equivalent. You just don't know it yet. And there's, there's even Christian preachers, allegedly Christian preachers, who are saying this these days. This is part of the great apostasy that's going on within the churches. But let's look at what the scripture says about this in Psalm 106, um, starting in verse 34. Now, this is recounting the journeys of the people of God out of Egypt towards the promised land, and we're picking up in the middle of the psalm. If I, if, I, if I read everything and say everything, we'll use up all of our time. And so I necessarily have to edit. So we're going to pick up at verse 34. Now they were told to go in and to cleanse the land, get rid of all these pagan nations, because their deeds were wicked. And God had given them more than enough time to repent. When the Lord had walked Abraham through the length and breadth of the land, so that's well before the Exodus, because the Lord had told Abraham, your descendants will go down to Egypt for 400 years. By the way, it's interesting to note, Plymouth Rock was 1620. We're in 2023. We are 403 years beyond Plymouth Rock, which was the establishment of the primary covenant with God by the founders of America. And I don't mean the, the founding fathers who did the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. I mean the Pilgrim Fathers who came here as refugees, religious refugees. They sailed from Holland. Half of them died in transit crossing the Atlantic. And when they landed, I forget, there was 51 or 52 of them left alive. Um, and that became the first real European contact with, uh, with the New World. That, that lasted. I'm not saying there wasn't other contact, but that was the first one that lasted and resulted in settlements uh, by people who were white. But I was at a, this is slightly off topic, but it's just interesting historical note. Um, I was at a historical tour presented by the National Park Service at Plymouth Rock a couple of years back, just ahead of COVID. And this guy was talking about how the pilgrims came to steal the land and the, and the food of the Indians. And I said, that's not true. And in front of a crowd of probably 200 people that were listening. And the guy stops and he looks at me and he goes, what? I said, they didn't come to steal the land. They were religious refugees 
They almost died, and when they got to the New World, they weren't sure how they were going to survive. They were trying to catch fish and take shellfish out of Massachusetts Bay and feed themselves with that, but they didn't have any you know, corn. They didn't have any vegetables. And so one of the local Native Americans showed them where their foodstuffs were and said, we want to help you survive. Here, take what you need. And the guy, the guy basically manifested, and he said, well, that, 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 that's not true. This tour is over. And that was the end of it. So it's amazing what a little bit of truth spoken judiciously can do to silence that stuff. Anyway, so that's, that's where the first covenant was made. And it's just interesting to me that it was roughly 400 years ago, and the people of God had to go into captivity in Egypt for 400 years before they came out. So God brings them out with a great deliverance, the story of the Exodus. And now let's pick up in Psalm 106, verse 34. So they're told to go in and take the land and destroy the inhabitants because of their many sins and iniquities. Then it says, verse 34, they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. So one of the clear commandments of the Lord is you are not to intermarry with these other nations when you come into the land. And why would you want to do that? Well, because a foreign accent is always attractive. It just is. And so women are drawn to it, men are drawn to it. It's like, wow, man, there's something about that just really gets my wheels turning. But they were told, don't do it. And the reason was not that God is a racist. It's because God knew that these other nations had other gods. And once you become romantically involved with somebody from another religious tradition, almost inevitably your own devotion to the Lord will dilute. And oftentimes you will abandon the Lord um, in the name of trying to preserve that relationship. That's just human history teaches us that. So the Lord, being infinitely wise, said, don't do it because it will take you away from me. Now watch this, verse 36. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. Okay, to serve their idols, who's the they? The they is the children of Israel. They began serving the idols of the nations around them, and they became snared. Does anyone know what a snare is? It's a, it's a kind of a trap. It usually involves a, a, maybe a piece of string or rope, maybe a wire, um, but it closes around the neck if it's an animal going between trees. It might close around the foot, but it, it, it keeps them from getting away, and then whoever the person is that set the snare comes up and kills the animal, or in this case, the person who is ensnared. So the idols became a snare. You serve other idols, you will become ensnared. Okay, what are some idols you might serve? Well, yoga is a Hindu religious accoutrement, and that might be one. You might get involved in transcendental meditation. Uh, maybe you become interested in, I don't know, this is also back to Hinduism, Ayurvedic therapy, or Reiki therapy, or any of these kinds of what we call alternative medicines or new age therapies. There's always some kind of idolatry behind it. And it will become a snare to you. And likely it will engender more physical illness possibly mental illness in you because you have served the idols of the nations round about. For a while, America was predominantly Christian, so it wasn't so much of a risk. But in the last 50 or 60 years, America has become far more open to other religious points of view. That's part of the warfare that we face on the earth. So they served their idols, which became a snare to them. Now watch this, and watch this carefully or you'll miss it. They sacrificed their sons and daughters to the demons. Wait a minute, I thought they were serving idols. Yes, thank you. The fact that they are serving demons means that they are serving idols, and the fact that they are serving idols means that they are serving demons. In other words, the power behind any idol, it may look like it's made of wood or stone or gold or something, but there's a spiritual force there that is malevolent and is after whoever worships it. And demons gain power from worship. Demons gain power from worship. So they poured out the innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters. Watch this. Whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, or Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood, 
and thus they became unclean by their acts. So this passage unambiguously states that any kind of re other religion, and it can even s seemingly be a good religion. A lot of people say Buddhism is a peaceable religion focused on contemplation. Come with me to Southeast Asia and see what happens when Buddhist demons act up and then tell me that they are peaceable demons. Or some people say, well, the Sikhs, they're nonviolent. No, the Sikhs are still not serving the one true God. And so spiritual warfare, one of the ways we encounter it here on level one of the three heavens is when we see religious conflict, which is ultimately behind most of the conflict of nations, because the scripture says elsewhere that all of the nations walk in the ways of their own God. So whatever they are discipled into by their, by their principality or, or Lord or dominion or whichever way you want to articulate that, whatever they are trained in, that becomes the dominant meme of their culture. So that's all scriptural clarification to what Chris just said. Well, that's very good and a hearty amen. And to add to the Daniel 9 verse that you read, I'd like to read from Daniel 10. And this shows it even, even further. I'll just um, pull it up here. Um, yeah, Daniel 10 verse 1. Now I'm reading, I brought with me uh, King James Version, so uh, I might sound 300 years old, but uh, the good old King Jimmy never you fails me. Too. Yeah, thank you. I feel it too. Um, Daniel 10 verse 1, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar, and the thing was true. But the thing, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, so the twenty-fourth day of the first Hebrew month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekel, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain um, man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Euphaz, his body was like beryl, his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now notice this carefully, verse 7, Daniel 10, verse 7. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. So see, one person can see and have a spiritual experience in the same place that others aren't, all right? But a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Verse 8, therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned into corruption, and I retained no strength. Basically, he's saying, I fasted 21 days, I'm wore out, okay? Verse 9. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, and set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. So he's in a posture of prayer. And he said to me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto you, and stand upright for unto you am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. I'll just stop for a minute. I believe people can have different encounters when they've had third heaven encounters. But just let me say to you, when you encounter the living God, you will fear, feel a fear of the Lord, a reverential awe. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know, mm -hmm. I hate to break the news to you, but it's vain imagination to say there are Ferris wheels in the throne room of heaven. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> like Forrest Gump, I have, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> all right? Now let me keep going. Verse 12. 
Then he said unto me, so he stood trembling, right? John said, I fell on my face like a dead man. We hear so much of this stuff about crawling up in daddy God's lap. And, and I believe that is, behold, the, the goodness and severity of the Lord. Amen. You can experience the yeah. goodness of God. Absolutely. God can reveal himself to you that way. But listen to me. Every person that, is, that doesn't know the Lord or is a sinner, okay, the only thing that will turn you to wisdom and knowledge is the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. And once you learn to fear the Lord at salvation, that fear or, or what took fear to cause you to repent and to turn, fear will evolve into love for God. So what once took fear of going to hell or fear of consequences kept you from doing it? As you mature in the Lord, you will love him and you'll what what it used to take fear to keep you from doing it. Now, as you've matured, love will stop you from doing it. And the reason Chris is emphasizing this, I think, I didn't ask him, but we talk a lot, so I think I know his process. Certainly the reason I would emphasize it, if I were emphasizing it, is if we're in a prophetic reformation, and I think we are, um, one of the things that has to be reset is the proper reverential fear of the Lord because we have come to a place of lawlessness in our time, all in the name of intimacy. And with that, we do things that are offensive to God. I'm going to use that term. Shocking to him. And we justify it, legitimize it by saying, well, God loves me anyway, or he knows my needs, or whatever. Pastor so-and-so said it's okay. The only guideline you have is right here. And you may say, well, I don't know what's in it. Start reading it. It's yeah. very simple. And as, as you can tell, I mean, Chris and I are taking on some of what are considered to be the most difficult and complex passages in Scripture, but they're actually not that hard to understand. If you'll just ponder it and read it, the Lord has written it in such a way, and I say the Lord, I recognize humans were the intermediaries, but the Lord has provided us his word in order that as long as you have a basic reading ability and maybe the ability to use a dictionary in these days, Google, so you can look up something you don't understand, you will get to the right answer as long as you just stay with this. That's right. Isaiah said if they don't walk according to this word, they have no light in them. So just think about that. Yeah, right. and, and no, that's okay. I, and, and, you know, for instance, you hear this verse quoted a lot. The goodness of God leads man to repentance that's true but if you're told verbally or someone teaches you about the goodness of god it can turn into lasciviousness you know i can just abuse this oh he's so good and that but if you get a revelation of the goodness of god it will lead to repentance. Yeah. There's difference between yeah. being told about the goodness Amen. of the Lord Amen. and getting a revelation of Amen. it. If you're told about his goodness, you might take advantage of it. If you get a revelation of his goodness, it will cause you to truly repent. Okay, let me finish quickly. Verse 12. Then said he unto me, Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and chasten yourself or fast before God, your words were heard from day one. And I am come for your words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood the, me one and twenty days, so twenty-one days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia, now I am come to make you understand what shall befall the people in the latter days, for the vision is yet for many days. So, I just wanted to show you the scriptural verse where that the angel himself that appeared to Daniel said, I got Michael to help me because the principality or the governing demon that is entrenched himself in this people group, this ethnic group's, uh, and, and their geography and their religious traditions and all of these things, the, that governing principality that 
directs and influences the human rulers of that people group, okay, opposed in the realm of the spirit in the second heaven, that third heaven angel where God abides from bringing that third heaven revelation to the earth. But you don't take on the principality, okay? You, you, you pray the word and God will activate his angels. You, the angels give heed to the voice of his word. I think many angels are unemployed. I, I, I mean, I'm serious. I believe many angels um, could be doing a lot more for us if we only understood they respond to the voice of his word. So if the word of God is written, and it's, this is the written form, this is the infallible word of God. If this is the written word, the logos, the thought, the plan, the idea of God, then God needs a voice for his word in every generation. And the angels give heed to the voice of his word. Not your command, your praying of the scriptures. He will give his angels charge over you to bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So I think we're supposed to answer questions, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, this is the Q&A session. So now that we've given you a bunch of free teaching. But I hope that you got this. This <laughs> here, just this session was worth coming to this conference. This was pretty high level no pun, I, I, I'm not trying to over uh, or exaggerate, uh, the, but this is an understanding that you're not going to hear all the time everywhere. And it has everything to do with developing the prophetic because you've got to be aware of your surroundings, where you're going, the governing principalities of that region, what you're going to be feeling, why you're feeling it, what spirits are predominant there. And you do that through discernment by Hebrews 5.14, by having your senses trained or developed to discern the difference between good and evil. And that's why the prophetic is so important. You can see, taste, hear, smell, and touch. You can see, you can hear the voice of God. You can taste and see that the Lord is good. Even in heaven, the prayers come up as a sweet smelling fragrance. So you can smell, see, taste, hear, smell, and touch. And so you can touch spiritual. You can hear the inaudible, feel, the intangible and see the invisible. And the prophetic makes it available as you develop your senses. This is why, you know, the last uh, three years, even at Morningstar, we've done a school of the prophets because there's so many people claiming prophetic gifting. And, and we've done it from September to May. It's been one weekend a month where people can come in person or do it online. And the overwhelming majority of people that have done this have said because of the activations and the teachings, they have dramatically increased in revelation. Now, you get the same thing with Kin's ministry or, or this local church. I'm just saying we need, if Elijah and Samuel had a school of the prophets, don't let people tell you, well, you can't teach the prophetic. Well, you might not be able to teach the prophetic, but you can teach people how to posture themselves uh, train their mind, train their senses, disciplines, how to posture themselves to be able to hear, process, discern, translate, interpret, apply, and time the voice of God. The other thing you can do is if you show people these things in the Word of God, again, the Word of God is living and active. And yes, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, but it will divide asunder I'll say flesh from spirit, soul from spirit. And many times people have experiences that are prophetic and they don't know that they're having prophetic experiences because in their family or their wherever they are, their church, they don't have language for it. They don't practice or approve or recognize these things. Um, so when I was a kid, uh, shortly after my father died, my mother and I were relocated to uh, an apartment from a nicer home uh, because my father was no longer there and you know, the, the income dropped. And so we had a roof over our heads and we ate, but, but there was a certain reduction in our lifestyle for sure. And so this apartment we lived in had two bedrooms and there was a hallway that 
ran down between the two bedrooms. And um, be outside of our respective bedroom windows, there was something like an alleyway. It wasn't exactly an alley, and to explain what it was would be too long. But the bottom line is, if somebody wanted to walk up and gain access through the window, they could have, provided the window wasn't locked. But of course, they could break the window, so there's still some risk. And in those years, I was just a young boy. I was very frightened of being stolen, of being kidnapped. Was it a rational fear? I don't know, maybe there was a danger and the Lord was you know, alerting me to that. Or maybe it was just an irrational fear of a little boy who had lost his daddy. But whichever one it was, doesn't matter at this point because it was a long time ago. <clears throat> but I was afraid that this was gonna happen. So one day, um, it, was, it was nighttime and I woke up and I can still see that bedroom as I'm telling you the story and there were two shining creatures standing in the doorway. And they were radiating light. They were about man-sized. And I kind of looked at them and they said, don't be afraid. Um, we're here to be sure that you're safe. And then they were gone. So I told my mom about it in the morning. And you know what she said to me? Oh, you just have an overactive imagination. And so basically, somebody rained on my parade <laughs> and I had a series of these things when I was young, where whether it was my mother or my grandparents, they were always kind of poo-pooing my various experiences like this to the point where it basically snuffed out the prophetic in me for a long time. And I would say, even at this advanced age, I still battled to get back to where I was in those younger years. And I've often asked the Lord, you know, give it back, give it back. <laughs> One of my other common ones that... Um, I had in that same rough period of time, um, there's a racetrack for horses in Los Angeles known as Santa Anita. Now it's not a big one like say Preakness or Belmont, but it's, but it's, it's one of the kind of places you go through on your way to the Preakness and the Belmont and so on. And uh, so people would go to Santa Anita and they would wager and bet on horses. And my mother was running with a crowd at that time who a lot of them did this and I had the ability to tell people what was, they were in, what was in their thoughts, to tell them their dreams, and um, <laughs> we would periodically get invited to parties, and my mother would always bring me along because she didn't have childcare for me, and so we'd go to these parties and I would read the mail of all the people at the parties. And let's just say that one night I did this unwisely as a kid who didn't have any filters, and uh, we were invited not to come back to any more parties because of what I said to somebody. It was right, but it was, it was not contextually and socially right. Um, I can't see you doing that at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, <laughs> what's changed? So anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah. So because of this thing that would go on, I became very afraid, again, of being kidnapped and being forced to tell the mafia which horses were going to win at Santa Anita. And I was sure that I would never see my mother again. And again, as a, as a kid who's lost his dad, this, was, this, this is not a, a rare or unusual kind of fear. Um, if you've ever had children who have lost a parent or been around them, maybe it's your niece or nephew or grandchild, uh, you'll know about this. So I was terrified this was going to happen to me, that I was going to be kidnapped I would never see my mother again, and I would be held hostage and forced to tell them which horse was going to win at Santa Anita so they could get rich. And um, so I asked the Lord uh, to take that gift away, and he did. <laughs> and it doesn't function like that anymore. I mean, periodically it'll pop up here and there. And again, as an adult, I've gone back and said, Lord, that was the prayer of a child. You know, I'd like you to switch that on again. But, you know, one of my own personal things that I'm after is, Lord, I would like you to give me that uncanny ability once again. So these kinds of things, you may have had experiences of your own. Your stories will be different from mine, but they'll be of this type. They'll be of this nature. Um, Chris started doing this at 14. Huh, I started earlier than you did. Um, but, but I stopped doing it too by the time I was 14. And so um, but you may have had these kinds of encounters, whether 
angels or whatever they were, supernatural knowledge. And it may be that those around you in your church or your family, they told you, you know, don't do this. This is silly. Uh, you're precocious. That was the word I was always told. You're precocious. Um, and this could be part of your block on why you are not functioning in the manner that you sense you're supposed to. And you may need to go back and do some work with the Lord about that. All right. I think that's enough of all this. We can I, take I agree. In fact, you know, one of the things that as I was, I got up at 5 a.m. this morning, just couldn't go back to sleep. So I just prayed and waited upon the Lord. And it's, it's so interesting you brought this up because the Lord told me there would be at least a dozen people here who had experiences as children that whether they had nightmares and so for some reason they either said it or subconsciously didn't want to dream anymore because of the nightmare mm. or they had spiritual encounters or experiences mm. and people poo-pooed them like he was talking about like he just described or their church or their family and told them to stop and so they asked it to stop or subtly wished in their heart it would stop and there would be at least a dozen people here that that experience has happened for, but the Lord's given me assurance that we would see a breakthrough with those people and you would be able to dream again and you're not going to let the nightmare stop you from dreaming. Amen. So if you're one of those at least a dozen that had encounters, had things as a child, and, and, and you didn't understand them, fear, whatever set in, Stand up. I want to pray for you right now. If you're in this room. Am I allowed to stand? Yeah, you okay. are. <laughs> well, there's at least a dozen for at sure. At least a dozen. So I don't know what degree of varying that was, but I, I knew the Lord said at least a dozen. And so. My goodness. Wow. Wow. Lord, I just pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ before we get into answering these questions uh, with your help. We just pray right now any subconscious thought because, Lord, we know the loudest voices in heaven are thoughts. And so even, Lord, if we've ever thought at some point in our childhood or our life, I wish this would stop, I don't want to do this. I'm scared to keep doing this or verbally said it. We, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our sovereign savior, anointed one, we ask those wishes, thoughts, or words would be reversed and that the grace of God would come upon them to be able to dream. And just like Joseph, who had a dreaming gift out and shared his dreams out of season and it put him through 20 years of from the pit to the prison to the palace. Ultimately, it was because he didn't give up on dreaming that he saved his brothers and his dad and his family and the whole known world from a famine that came to the earth because he refused to stop dreaming even though 20 years prior, a dream got him uh, betrayed and sold into slavery in telling that dream. So we just reverse that now in the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask for a quick activation and that there would begin a restoration of those things that once were, that have lost. And we pray that the Lord would restore that which he took not away. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you are going to begin to feel it right now. Somebody's going to feel a warmth come over you like warm water right now. I see you in the spirit. You're a woman. Wherever you are, lift up your hand. Something has happened. There you are back there, right back there. Yeah, you feel that warmth coming over you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. I still see that amber light hanging over your head. And I see it's just like Anna the prophetess on the steps of the temple. I don't know if Anne or Anna is significant or is relevant to you. It's your middle name. 
All right. Well, that's good to know. So, Lord, we just pray every bit that she's been through, trauma, loss, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will restore that which you took not away. And the, what the palmer worm and the canker worm and the locust and all of that, uh, we pray that you will restore it sevenfold to her. And listen to this. This is significant. You were the only one that raised your hand that said you felt the warmth. You saw it back there. Yeah, I don't know if you saw, I saw it. it. I, I, hear, I just heard this. This is going to, I heard a bell. Dong. There's something to do with a bell. And I don't know exactly what it means, but I believe there's a bell ringing in heaven right now signifying I don't know if this is relevant to you in the past or not, but it's happening now. There's a bell ringing as a notification that the time up and God times up. God is breaking the power of delay mm. off of your life. Delay of fulfillment of promises and all that he has for you. There's something about bell. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a location if you have a bell on your property, you have a bell. You have a bell and you ring it sometime. Okay. I don't know if there's something about a bell road. I see a road uh, with a bell on the road. I don't know if that means anything to you or not, but it's like a, a street or something with something with bell. I don't know what that exactly means. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I, I see that on, on, the, on this road. Does it make sense to you? Or is that, it, it will, oh, it will. <laughs> There's something to do with bell. A, a bell road or a bell street. So, Lord, we just pray in the name of Jesus. That the power of delay will be broken. For my dear sister, in Jesus' name. I see you ringing that bell, but it's being rung in heaven on your behalf. Yeah, there you go. That's the prophetic act of ringing that bell. It's a sign it's time for something to happen. It's dinner time. Come to the table. Come to the table. In Jesus' name. And it's not just for her, it's for all of you. You're going to know, something's going to come to you about that. There's something to do with a road and something to do with a bell. And I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's like, I don't know if ringing a road, ringing a bell on the the road, it's going to come to you, and mark my words, we'll hear about it. <sighs> but you didn't tell me that you, any, any of this stuff, like about the whole, uh, you know, as a child and then getting it back or nothing like that. There's no way I could know that, but the Lord knows it. And um, praise God. Just, Lord, just bless St. Patty in Jesus' name. I just gave a word of knowledge there, whether you realize it or not. <laughs> All right, let's take some questions. Do we have a roving mic beyond the one Chris has? Okay. So if we call on you, I'm going to say this twice just for emphasis. You need to belt it out. This is not normal conversational tone you need to be using. For a lot of you, this is hard. It's embarrassing. You feel like you're being rude. You are authorized not to scream, but to yell. Okay, and it's for the purposes of everyone in the room hearing what you're saying because we don't have a microphone for you. First hand up was that man right there.
Well, I'm, I'm really trying to, just to be honest with you, um, you know, back in the Kansas City Prophets era and all of that, there was a lot of the prophetic that just, it wasn't attached to politics as right. near as much. Yeah. And um, I, I will say this, I still stand on that. Biden has, I think, another year and a half before he would it'd be the end of his, his, uh, his term. Uh, it's interesting that you're asking this question because I did see whether this is good or bad news. A special counsel was appointed yesterday on behalf of Hunter and his business dealings and his dad and all of that. So without getting into Biden bashing or anything like that, I pray for his salvation. Um, but I think health and legal issues and a lot of things could pile up. And in that same word, I also saw uh, Putin's um, time coming to an end uh, as well. And uh, you saw about a month and a half ago, there was a mutiny uh, that started. Uh, there'll be another one. And you will see uh, the uh, end of Putin's reign as the president of Russia. And I believe in what I shared was that there would not be a lot of time difference between the end of Biden's time and the end of Putin's time. And it would be ironic in the sense that two of the great nation, national powers on the earth, their presidents would somehow, their terms would end in an unexpected or untimely way pretty close together and that, that that's, as far as I know, not a historical thing uh, that's happened, that a U.S. president and a Russian president have closely, out of season or outside of term limits and such, the end of their, uh, their time. So I think we've got a mic wired mic for you. So oh. We're going to hand off the rover. There we go. Testing. There we go. All right, Susan. So about the, I have two questions. Um, what do you think this is Kmart and it's the well, Blue Light Special? <laughs> All right, the first one, and then you don't want to answer the second one, that's fine. Um, with the seeing gift, I'm really curious because I minister to a lot of people that see like you do, um, but I haven't yet. Um, but anyway, it's, I, I don't know how to minister to them sometimes. And my question is, um, like, does this turn on and off for you? Like, it, you know, like you're st sitting up there and I know you see a lot of things while you're talking up there. Are you like seeing stuff and then you just can do both or can you suspend it while you're doing life uh, in a different way? I just so I, when I first, so I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at eight years old. I started consistently preaching at 14. Um, in 2011 uh, is when the prophetic um, really began to activate. Paul Kane told me that I was born with it and that I had to go through a certain trial in my life. There's something about trials that unearth things in us. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, he that suffers in the flesh will cease from sin. Well, you don't hear that one preached very much, do you? Anyway, when this first started happening and I would be ministering places and I would look at someone and I would see, the thought would come to me, heart disease. Um, or look at someone in cancer or look at someone in depression. There began to be a time where I began to ask people, does this mean anything to you? And it got, I got to trusting it because it was accurate. So at first, it was... Um, I had had a, a, a couple of visible experiences prior to that, um, but, but at first it was just knowing, my knower, discerning. Then it turned into um, seeing and, and hearing and feeling. And at first, when this started to happen, I'd walk into a restaurant with my family. We would sit down, and I didn't even realize what was happening. but. I literally could not go out to eat because I would feel social anxiety. And I didn't know why. I'm thought, man, what's wrong with me? You know, there, my life is clean before the Lord. I don't understand. 
And I was picking up on the sins, the sicknesses, the thoughts of the heart of the people around me. And it was like drinking water from a water hose or fire hose. And so I had to learn how by process, like I said, some of this is taught and some of it is caught. And I basically learned how that there are times where I have to shut that off. It, and it's a conscious thing that I do. And if the Lord really still wants to press through, He can. But I learned how to manage that. I hate to say it that way, but it's like I learned, you know, that's why a lot of prophetic people have had nervous breakdowns. Um, just because you learn the process that you go through, whether you see, hear, or what, whatever it may be. Um, but uh, to answer your question, yes, I do think, let me say, how many of you in the room are dreamers? Okay, a lot of you. Uh, a, 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 prof, a prophet, okay? So think of, think of in terms of if you're a dreamer, now you can be a dreamer and not be a prophet or even have a prophetic gift, okay? But when someone dreams, their subconscious mind, you know they say dreams happen a matter of mere seconds. Like, but when you're sleeping, right, it feels like it's playing out for a long time. The dream that you're having is your, your conscious mind is shut down. That's why you are asleep. I mean, how many of you know what I mean? If you can't get your conscious mind to shut down, you have a hard time going to sleep, falling asleep. So a prophet who has visions or the visionary realm is like when someone is dreaming. Your dream takes place in your subconscious mind. It's over here. And your conscious mind is over here. If you're a prophet and you see visions, it's like dreaming when you're awake. You're seeing us, but you're also only seeing it at the same time, and that doesn't somehow come. Yeah, I don't see things all of the time, but there's much of the time, especially after I preach. That's when, because the Lord confirms his word with signs and wonders. That's when I've found I've had the most success uh, with getting in the flow of the prophetic. And so, um, like for instance, last night I didn't speak, Ken spoke. But the word that he spoke was so right on and so resonated with me. I wasn't even planning on doing any of that, what happened last night. You didn't see it. Uh, I think it's, I think they recorded it or, okay, it's online. Um, none of that was planned. I mean, like for instance, last night I got here late. Uh, to answer your question, I, I was stuck in traffic for an hour <laughs> yesterday, which is why I didn't get here in time for dinner. And so I, I got here and I had to come in, go in the hotel and change. And I just laid down for just like 10 minutes. And right around 6.17, I wrote a note in my phone that's time-stamped. You all know how that works, right? The note app. Um, and I showed it to the people. I saw a man standing. I was standing on the platform. I didn't even know what the church looked like. I'd never been here. Okay? But I saw a man from standing from the platform in the back and from the platform looking to the right with white hair and I saw a gray shirt, and he had a heart condition. That was a predictive word of knowledge. Now, is that man here today? I don't know if he is or not. You had on a gray shirt underneath. <laughs> Yeah, oh, praise God for that. But but everybody here that, that looked at him, it looked gray. At distance, it looked gray because yeah. the blue and the green blended in such a way. 
and the pattern was a small enough pattern that, you know, at this distance it appeared, to, and nearly everyone in the room who looked at him raised their hand and said, yeah, it looks like a gray shirt. So what I did was this. I just sat back and I said, Lord, whatever you want to say, I'm listening. And I just thought, unlike transcendental meditation, which tells you to empty your mind, I didn't do that. I thought upon the Lord. Meditated upon. You meditate on Scripture. Think upon the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. And then a it wasn't an open vision, but it was a mental movie. Now, when I say that phrase, does that make sense to how many of you have ever caught some people call it daydreaming? It, it, it's like you're sitting there and you're looking around and you're physically seeing one thing, but a mental movie is playing in your mind of a scenario that may not be a vision, but it may be something that has happened that you're replaying or some hypothetical thing that you're afraid might happen. I have learned, because I've tested it, therefore I've trusted it, which is why prophetic conferences like this one, prophetic schools are important, because that's where you learn to trust your feelings, or your mental pictures, or your mental movies in a safe environment. Okay? And so I wrote it down, and when we got in here, I sat down over there, and Ken was sitting there next to me. I pulled out my phone. I saved the note. Anybody can see it that wants to. It's time stamp, 617. I, I don't know if you were here yet or not by that point. You may have been helping. I don't know. Um, but I wasn't here, and everybody knows that. I was not here. The parking lot attendants will tell you I got here around 720. Um, and so I saw him sitting I mean, and it fit exactly the location where he was sitting, in the back, to the right, color of his hair, color of the shirt, and now his undershirt's gray. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that is, and I wrote that down because I knew, and this happens a lot. The last time I went to Kansas City to speak at IHOP at, you know, Mike Bickle's ministry, I had a word of knowledge I wrote down as a note in my phone, and I never even entered into the church, okay? I was backstage sitting with Mike Bickle and Stuart Greaves, and I had this vision, and here's what I saw. I saw a man with gray hair, a black um, button-up short sleeve shirt, but here's the interesting thing. It was early March, and it was snowing. So a short sleeve shirt, but I specifically wrote it down. Um, a white man with gray hair, um, a black short sleeve button up shirt. I saw the health condition. I may have this part wrong just because it's whatever, six or seven months later, but I saw a feet condition, a knee condition. I saw he had a son named Christopher, just like uh, me. And I saw the name of the street that he lived on, and I had it all written down, and I hadn't even got there. And, I, and here's the interesting story. He later came up to told Mike Bickle, you all know who he is, right? Um, and Stuart and, and myself and others, I know he told this story. He said, right before the service that night, he said, and, and I just got there that afternoon. He said, but we went out to eat. He said, I had a long sleeve shirt on, but we went and sat down and ate a hamburger, and I got ketchup all over my shirt. He said, so I had to go back to the hotel to change before church began, and the only shirt that I had was a black button-up short sleeve shirt. <laughs> so you said before you saw, like, depression on somebody or this on somebody but when you have a word like that um that specific prophetic word i mean on, god is obviously wanting to touch that man absolutely and but but is everything you see you know you have to use some sort of discernment of like because you see a lot or i know people that see a lot and it's not everybody that they touch maybe it's just for you to have some wisdom about yeah, and that's where timing 
and application, that process of getting the revelation, interpretation, application, and timing. You ought to write that down, those four uh, steps. Uh, and here's the reason why. Sometimes everything God shares you, he doesn't, shares with you, he doesn't want you to share. Why? The Lord likes to reveal his secrets to his friends. Right. Daniel shared a dream to his brothers of the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowing down to him. And that was his mom and dad and his 11 brothers bowing down to him. Okay? He shared that dream. Was it a God dream? Absolutely. Was it from the Lord? Absolutely. What happened? <laughs> Threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery, and put him on a life of misery for many years because he <clears throat> had a prophetic dream, but he shared it to the wrong people at the wrong time. He shared another dream 20 plus years later to the same men, his brothers, and that dream saved the world from a known famine. So it depends on the timing, how people perceive you, what's going on in their heart. They received his prophetic gift at a different time. So just as much as you get the revelation or you feel the revelation, it's cancer or migraine headaches or whatever, you also feel, should I share or should I not? And, and, and just like there's a difference between, okay, so you, so you never would let fear stop you from sharing it, but the counterfeit or the opposite of, of fear is, I don't want to operate in presumption. I don't want to do, I, I said counterfeit. I, I guess what I'm saying is fear is the counterfeit of, of, of being reserved and not operating in presumption because if you give a word, and you're not covered with prayer and intercession and grace, sometimes the blowback is hell. There have been times I've stood up and given words that were from God, but I didn't have the proper prayer, the proper intercession, the proper people praying for me, and it became torment that night. Okay, because of the retaliation. Um, so, just like there's a counterfeit, okay, to uh, not operating in presumption, the counterfeit to that would be fear. Well, I'm afraid I'll get it wrong or they'll think I'm crazy. Uh, well, just like there's a difference between discernment and suspicion. Suspicion is the carnal version of the spiritual gift of discernment. Does that make sense? But they look very similar. The devil has a counterfeit to everything. Yep. So many people call, well, I discerned that so-and-so, there's something wrong going on there behind the scenes. No, it's not. You didn't discern it. It was suspicion, you know, because you already had a preconceived bias and negativity towards that person. Now, can the Lord cause you to have discernment? Yes, but make sure it's free of your confirmation bias. Yep. Other questions over here? in the orange top right there. St. Patty? Uh-huh, her name is Patty. Praise the Lord. I said it was a word of knowledge. <laughs> you did. Patty Ann. So back to the word that you were just describing. I, I didn't stand up because it was for my son, and his name is Andrew, and he works in a, a place that every one of the road names starts with Bell. It's called Bell Park, and all five roads within that park are Bell, and he used to see exactly the way you saw. But does, he, does, he, does he ever draw uh, or, or paint or anything like that? His paintings as a child were very interesting. <laughs> So that he you remember see, that he could see so many, he could oh. see, he could feel, he could it very, very, but sensitive. you know, for sure that he would draw and paint by divine inspiration. I don't know, but it, the things that he saw looked like they were demonic. Like he could see into the demonic. Realm. Did he paint those stuff? 
spiritual stuff. That's what. I don't know uh, if he painted. I remember drawings. He may have painted, but we have four kids. Well, because so right, he, yeah. he right, yeah, <laughs> four kids, right? Well, you said that, and here's a divine pun. I know he has because you said Anne, and you you were talking about the bell, and then you said Anne drew. The, the Lord's sense of humor. He drew. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. And not only that, in London, one of the most famous bells is the Bell of St. Andrews. There are some others that are also famous, but that's one of the big ones. Okay, other comments, questions? Yeah, right there in the center of the section. I don't know how you're going to get in there, Don, but... Okay. How can we differentiate between when the political spirit is prophesying and when the Holy Spirit is prophesying? Confirmation bias is one of the biggest things to look for. Um, so you asked about the political spirit. Let's just wind the clock back to 20, late 2019, or, or excuse me, tw late 2019 coming into 2020. So we're starting to ramp up to the election and the words start coming forth. Do you know that most prophets in the United States live in southern states? Let's just start there. Not all. There are some exceptions. I mean, there's a cluster of them up in Redding, so that's California. We've got a few of them in Los Angeles, not as many, but, but we have some in L.A. Um, there was a small pot of them up in Connecticut for a while. But the majority of prophets who live in the United States live in southern states. And even more specifically, they live in South Carolina, they live in uh, Tennessee, and they live in Texas. There's, there's some in Florida too, but not, not anywhere near as many. Well, all of the states I just named are strongly Republican. They're what we call red states. And so there's, a, there's an inbuilt bias towards Republicans. Republicanism is good, small government, conservative fiscal policy, uh, doesn't support a progressive social agenda. These are the things that traditionally have drawn people to the Republican Party. Some other things too, but those would be on the short list of items that people who identify as Republican uh, tend to associate with. And many of the things that are associated with the Democratic Party are, they're the inverse of that, you know, un, unbridled spending all in the name of social good, uh, tax and spend to fund all that, so higher taxes, um, a lot of regulations, so maybe anti-competitive behavior, uh, certainly a very progressive social agenda on every level. So we can just kind of, you know, we can see the, the, the differences between the two just in these few points that I've listed. Well, when you've got people who live in strongly red states, usually it's because they've chosen to live in strongly red states. They like the political environment. And as a result of that, um, it's often the case that they have a bias. They have a predisposition. Now, biases are, everybody has them, just to be clear. Um, both Democrats and Republicans have them, prophets have them, apostles have them. Pastors have them, but uh, one of the things you have to do when you're going to prophesy is you have to suspend your own thoughts about things because the Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My ways are higher than your ways, which could mean that actually what he intends is contrary to what you expected, and you've, you've got to learn to hear what he is saying whether or not it's, it's palatable to you. So, um, St. Ignatius Loyola talked about this in his spiritual exercises. He was the founder, by the way, of the Jesuit order. Nobody manifest. Um, they started out as a very good organization. I know they ran the Spanish Inquisition for a while. That was a problem. Which just goes to show you can start well and veer off, right? And it's part of why we have to keep ourselves in hand. We have to walk with the Spirit, is what the Scripture says, which is another way of saying keep yourself in check. And don't just assume that every idea that hits you is God's idea. You need to weigh and test internally before you ever release out of your mouth. We talked about that last night. 
<clears throat> so, St. Ignatius Loyola says in the Spiritual Exercises that one of, the, one of the essentials of Christian maturity is to come to the place of spiritual neutrality. And that means, as Jesus did in Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. So Jesus did not want to go to the cross. That's clear. He was willing to go to the cross if that's what his father wanted. But that was not what he wanted. And we know it because he said, Father, if there is any way for this cup to pass from me, let it be so. And he's sweating great drops of blood as he's praying it. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so he yields and allows himself to be arrested. And even as he's being arrested, he says, don't you think I could summon more than 12 legions of angels? Because I am the son of God. But he doesn't do that. He, he holds off on doing that because he's yielding to the Father's will. So he's allowing himself to be subjected to something that's not his own desire, but his Father's desire. Now, use that as a template and think backward in time to when Jesus comes off the Mount of Transfiguration and he says to Peter and the others, who do men say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're Jeremiah come back or John the Baptist or one of the other prophets. And he says... Okay, and who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he goes, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Your spiritual senses are tuned in. Uh, we could say your gateways are open. And in that, you received revelation of who I am. And then he goes, now that you received the first revelation, let me give you a higher revelation. Because this is always the purpose of the Lord to take us deeper or higher. You can use either word. I don't care as long as you understand that it's a fuller, richer understanding. He says, um, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, and he will be killed. And Peter immediately pivots, and he goes, never will it be this way, Lord. You're the Son of God. You're the one who's supposed to take the throne of David. And now Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan, for your mind. This, the, the mind is the realm of the soul. This is not operating out of the spirit man. It's the soul man. It's a big difference, but soul and spirit can look very similar. That's why we need the word of God, which is living and active, to divide asunder soul from spirit, because for most people, they don't know the difference. Most people don't know the difference. So out of Peter's mind... Jesus says, your mind is fallen. And because your mind is fallen, you have not in mind the things of God, but the things of men. What do men want to do? Build kingdoms, establish governments, get laud and accolade from other men or women. But it's the purpose of my father that I go to die. And so Jesus has to rebuke Peter because Peter has a bias, an inbuilt leaning towards something, back to the 2020 election. So coming up to that, we've got all these Southern Republican prophets. Do you really think that they're going to prophesy a Democrat win? I mean, they could. I'm not saying it's impossible. But the confirmation bias is so strong. Democrats are bad. And, and let's be clear, I vote Republican most of the time, and it's only when we have a scoundrel that I would vote Democrat because there's not really an option. But so I'm, I'm predominantly a Republican voter. And I did vote for Trump because I thought he was the better candidate given the factors. So I don't, don't think I'm a turncoat here. But, but I just want to say this. I saw the problems with Donald Trump before he was ever elected because he had a shady business reputation in New York State, and you don't need to go very far to research that. Um, and I'm not even talking about whether he fudged the financials on his organization. He, he mistreated contractors and short paid them and said, sue me, I'll see you in court. And what do you know, the amount that they were still owed would be about what the legal fees would be. And so it was part of how he enriched himself by being an unethical businessman. This is a true statement. As somebody who voted for Trump, I recognize this. So I knew there were issues. <laughs> yeah, Dwight's putting his fingers over his ears. So 
so I think we're, we're supposed to be wise and discerning about these things, but I voted for Trump because as I looked at the choices, I was like, Trump's better, even the, given these factors, he's better than what we would get if we went Democrat. So I didn't have that confirmation bias. I tend to vote Republican, I said that already, but I don't suspend my rational faculties either, and I always submit what I'm going to do to the Lord. So when I came to vote, when I came to vote on the 2016 election, I always vote absentee because I travel in ministry and I'm normally not home on election day. And so I vote absentee, not mail in, just to be clear. Um, so I always have my ballot in advance. There is a difference. There is a difference, big difference. And that's what partly convoluted the 2020 election and separated it from all other previous elections is we had because of something that happened starting in March, COVID. <laughs> we had this mass melon voting that these states did not have the infrastructure in place to be able to validate all of that. That's why there was so much confusion and question. Florida already had it in place. That's why they were able to call the winner the night of the election. Yeah. But you, that's why, you know, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. No. I'm just saying there's a lot that went into, thankfully I wasn't important enough yet, uh, and I'm still not, but for, for to predict ahead of time Trump to win in 2020. I did make a statement after the election that I believed that God would turn the situation around, but I never uh, predicted Trump to win. I think that the, the issue, of, I think a lot of people voted against Trump because of his personality. Mm -hmm. Yep. But his policies worked. That's we true. didn't have any wars. Economy booming. The economy was booming. Anybody remember gas and groceries and interest rates and inflation and uh, crime, you know, and all this stuff. That's right. And, and, and he was pro-life. By the way, Roe v. Wade was overturned because he appointed three Supreme Court justices. That's right. We've been praying for that for 50 years. Literally for 50 years. So, um, you know, and, and so all of that being said, that's why people traditionally that hold a traditional biblical value, you know, traditional marriage, that's, that's right. a conservative Republican view, uh, pro-life, um, you know, you know, somebody was so offended at the idea of a wall, and I'm not getting in the political spirit here, but I'm just pointing out, you know, that, I mean, it's hard to believe that people are so offended by that when there's a wall around the new Jerusalem. The Romans walls of Jasper. Built, the Romans built walls. I mean, this is The crazy. Chinese built the Great Wall of China. And it says without the walls were dogs yeah. and sorcerers and whoremongers. And so yeah. Acts 17, actually verse 26 says, And God has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation and where they were dwell. So it's not racist to believe that nations should have boundaries. So without getting into all of that, yeah. I'm just saying 2020 was a convoluted mess because you cannot, from March to November, change the entire way we voted for 200 plus years and expect there to be people to not have questions, especially when the question is, how did an 80-year-old man get 16 more million votes than the first black president. <laughs> so back on the political spirit question. <laughs> I got in the spirit, forgive me, the political spirit. Don't get me started. Lord, have mercy. So what you have to do is you have to recognize what your own biases are. And I'm recognizing mine. I'm dealing with it. I'm <laughs> coping with it. Well, I would say there are times when biases come about through decent logic. I mean, 
deficit spending is not a good idea. Uh, Republicans are guilty of it. Democrats are generally more guilty of it, but not universally more guilty. For example, did you know that when Bill Clinton left office, we had a surplus in the U.S. government budget? Mm -hmm. He was a Democrat. I didn't really like Bill Clinton's policies, but I can acknowledge what he did fiscally that was more sound yeah, even than what Donald thing. Trump did. This is true. And I'm not turning Democrat on you, so don't get riled up here. But you see, confirmation bias will prevent you from even seeing the kind of thing that I just said. So you have to recognize, okay, these are my biases, but not my will, Lord, but thine. What would you have me to do? And so here's an example of how that worked. I think there were a lot of people who recognized ahead of the 16 election some of the issues with uh, Donald Trump. And I would say that even within the conservative camp, the evangelical camp, many people were not sure what to do. And so there was a lot of talk of Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, um, others, but those were the big two who were other possibilities. And then suddenly Rick Joyner and Lance Wallnau, the word of the Lord comes to them. And depending on how you measure it, Rick might have up to 60 million followers on all the various forms of communication that he employs. That's the founder of the ministry that I now lead, by the way. That's, yeah. that's the founder so. of Morningstar. And then Lance has, again, depends how you measure it, but maybe up to 20 million people. And there'd be some overlap. But the Democratic Party didn't see this coming. The Republican Party didn't see this coming. And it looks like the election's going to be a, a runaway for Hillary Clinton. The mainstream media doesn't see it coming. And Lance and Rick hit the airwaves and they say, we've received the word of the Lord. The Lord says Donald Trump is the one that he wants in the White House. And suddenly most of Christendom in this country pivots and votes for Donald Trump. And that gives him the election. Now, if you weren't listening to the Lord, you might say, Donald Trump is a scoundrel. I know he has dirty business dealings. And what about the way he treats women? You got this list of reasons not to do it. And by the way, let's just pause here for a moment. I don't want to get on a rabbit trail and I want to wrap up this comment. But part of Lance's word was Donald Trump is the new Cyrus out of Isaiah 45, which speaks of Cyrus. Donald Trump's name is not Cyrus. It's a prophetic analogy. But let's be clear, if he is a Cyrus-type person, what do Persian kings do? Did anyone ever read the book of Esther? Line up the 100 prettiest women in the entire empire, give them a year of cosmetic treatments and put them in the gym, and when they look their best, I'm going to sleep with every single one of them, and I'll pick the one I want to marry. That's what Persian kings do. I know that's crude and gross. I tried to say it in an acceptable way for mixed company. You did but a that, great job, by the way. That is what Persian kings do. So, yeah, Donald Trump is a philanderer. He was, that's true. And he had dirty business dealings, as I indicated. But he's nevertheless the one God picked, just like nevertheless God picked to Cyrus in the time of Isaiah, a literal man named Cyrus. Let's not confuse Donald Trump with Cyrus. He did that. And so the Lord spoke to Lance out of Isaiah 45 and said, as Cyrus, so also Donald Trump. That's where this idea of Trump as Cyrus came from. And it was chapter 45, yeah, and, is, Trump and Trump was, was the president. 45th president. Yeah, Trump was the 45th president. So there's a prophetic play going on there out of the word of God. And so, boom, Trump wins the election. And he did pretty well by our country in the first term. So, and he held to his promises, unlike many politicians, and on down the line. So, how would you get to Donald Trump is the, you know, new version of Cyrus, and he's the one God picks? You suspend your confirmation bias, and you ask the Lord, who do you want to have be the president? And you listen, and even if you're gritting your teeth saying, oh, but I was going to vote for Marco Rubio, or I was going to vote for Ted Cruz, or this time, because I just couldn't get there, as one friend of mine who is a lifelong ardent Republican and never has voted ever anything other than Republican, she voted for Biden because she said, I can't stand Donald, Trump, Donald Trump's misogyny. I can't stand his business dealings. I'm voting for Biden. And I said, do you realize all the issues that come with that? I don't care. 
All right, well, you're never going to hear the Lord if your mind is closed. That's how you know a political spirit is operating. And sometimes the people that think the political spirit is on somebody else <laughs> is actually on, on them. Um, I hope you hear that. I, I, just two things. There's a couple of other things. Aside from the mass mail-in votes that the states didn't have an infrastructure to validate, uh, there's a movie called 2,000 Mules by Dinesh D'Souza. I encourage you to watch it. Shameless plug. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so there's a couple of other things. Anybody ever heard of a prophet named Kim Clement? Kim Clement prophesied in 2007 that Donald Trump would become president. And it's eerie. Um, I work with the man who pastored the church that he based out of. It was Kim's ministry, but in 2007, Kim said, Trump, you can find it online, YouTube, look it up. Trump shall become a trumpet. I said the Trump will become a trumpet. I will raise up the Trump to the highest seat in the nation. And the man who watched over New York City over 9-11 will sit in the highest seat of the office of the land, and they shall say he has hot blood, that he'll be a man of temper, but he will force to be become a praying president and that he would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But there was one other part of that prophecy. For two terms, that's what Clem, Kim Clement said. So I think a lot of the prophets, because of you know the, the prophets that you alluded to, endorsed Trump. Because the truth is, Trump resonated with a lot of people despite they couldn't stand his personality. He said what a lot of us have been thinking for years about a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, not everything, the by no means. The swamp and stuff like that. Um, and the only reason really why he won in 2016, because Hillary's negatives were higher than his. That's just the truth. Um, but a, a lot of people assumed that he would get elected and piggybacked, I think, off the Kim Clement word. And usually a president will have to have two terms consecutive when you think of two terms. Now, I'm not prophesying that Trump's going to be uh, the president again, uh, but I do um, think that influenced that a lot. People, well, Kim Clement prophesied Trump yep. before he was even running that he would become the president, and all of it was right, and he said for two terms. Uh, so why wouldn't he win this election? Especially, I think, when people were seeing every rally he held had 40, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 people showing up. Um, and so Ken is right. We have to detach ourselves let me and, and i'll finish with this in 1992 talking about rick joiner and we talked about paul kane paul kane before the 1992 election yeah believe it or not up until 2020 we had election day now we have election month it's true <laughs> <clears throat> don't get me started anyway <laughs> Uh, we had election day up until 2016, and even then, we knew the day of who would win. But anyway, Bill Clinton, of course, was a Democrat, and of course, he did balance the budget. Even though he had issues, we all have had issues in some form or another. Um, he made mistakes while in office. We all make mistakes in various ways. He was a philanderer ways. like Donald Trump, right? Exactly. Monica Lewinsky, does anyone remember that? But, but he sure. got coverage for that because the, the media often is an extension of the Democratic Party Absolutely. that Trump wasn't afforded by the media. Here's an interesting data point. I'm not going to cut Chris off, but I'm just going to insert it here. They did a poll recently, early this year, and they found out that the news chiefs at the major newspapers and networks in this country, 96% of them are 
hard left Democrats. They're not even centrist Democrats. 96% of them are hard left Democrats. We're talking the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, Chicago Sun Tribune, Dallas Morning Herald, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, etc. The heads of these networks and newspapers, which are the organs of mainstream media, 96% hard left Democrats, not, not centrist Democrats. That's why you see the bias in the media that you see. Yeah, and that's the reason why Eric Trump or Donald Trump Jr., if they were doing the stuff that's alleged that Hunter's doing, it would be all anyway. So in 1992, Paul Kane calls Rick Joyner and tells him, the word of the Lord came to me, and Bill Clinton is the man. George Bush, um, obviously, you all remember Ross Perot uh, was a, thank good old Ross that, that we got the Clintons. But anyway, really, genuinely, <laughs> he split the Republican Party. He split the party enough to where, so anyway. Um, and Paul Kane tells Rick, the Lord showed me that Bill Clinton. Uh, has a heart, something like this, has a heart that is tender for the Lord. And he said, I have saw five headlines of what it will be after Election Day on the major newspapers of America. And he told Rick them verbatim. Rick wrote them down. And then Paul wrote them down, sealed them in an envelope, mailed them before the election, post-dated it, everything showing when it was mailed we still have the envelope sealed to this day but we know what was in the envelope the lord showed paul kane the exact verbatim headlines five of the major newspapers in america the day after the election that bill clinton won now bill clinton also worked um with the speaker of the house uh, newt gingrich and that's partly how the the balance got uh, the budget got balanced. But anyway, we have to be careful. And to answer your question regarding the thing about Biden and, and Putin, I have been very intentional. One of the things I've taught in my school of the prophets that, that I teach at Morningstar is we can't allow our confirmation bias to affect our how we prophesy. Your worldview will affect what you prophesy and how you prophesy it. Just like in Jeremiah 23, you Absolutely. quoted last yeah, night. That's right. Remember that who stood in the council of the Lord, right? That God was basically telling Jeremiah all the other prophets that were considered false. What were they predicting? Judah will never be overtaken. We're God's people. They'll never overtake us. Now, were they called false prophets because they didn't have a gift? Of course not. But it's only because they believed their nation was special and thought that somehow God would never allow their nation to come under judgment because of the, the nation's behavior. And Jeremiah was the only one that stood up and said, Nope, I've stood in the council of the Lord. That Babylon will overthrow uh, am I saying this right? I think I'm getting all this yeah, no, right. You got it right. Babylon will overthrow Jerusalem, and, Jer and, and Judah will go into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. So there's an example of the political spirit. When you tell your people of your nation, our side's going to win. Our side can't lose. God's on our side. Well, let me tell you something. Telling people what God wants to happen versus saying this is what will happen is different. Somebody says, well, what's the difference? I thought what God wants is always going to happen. Really? Then why did he tell us in the Lord's Prayer to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? If, if that was a given, he wouldn't tell us to pray that. The fact that he tells us to pray his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven tells us that sometimes it's not. His will isn't done. Every time a baby's been aborted, his will wasn't done. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should be saved and come to a knowledge 
of the truth. Well, does everybody get saved? Apparently not. So a lot of us have been given this sovereignty teaching, and God is sovereign. He does rule the universe, and ultimately everything conforms to his will in the long in the long run. But there are these things along the way where we see that very, the nature of spiritual warfare, which is what we started out talking about. Uh, this is the, just the way it unfolds. We probably have time for one more question and then we're gonna have to wrap it up. So I saw that hand first. Oh, it's our man in black who had the Sorry. not so gray, but actually appeared gray shirt last night. It really did look gray. It looked gray to me. I think Chris was in bounds. I'm calling it a strike. <laughs> no, he was behind me, so. Yeah, he's gone. Yeah, he's gone. So I kind of feel like I'm going to have tomatoes thrown for changing direction of this wagon a little bit. No, it's oh, fine. No, it's with fine. My this question. is open mic day. Um, but I, I do want to preface that with I asked the Lord on the day, the, the first day of the election, what was going on the first I, day the first day <laughs> you're talking um, about the 2020 election yes okay because i was like no this is not going the right way and he just said i'm letting it go this way because i'm going to expose it all that's all i heard wasn't happy about it but that's what i heard uh but my question is a deliverance question so in a time of deliverance and I feel like probably both of you would speak into this. Um, can you speak into the dynamic of the, of the person doing ministry and the giftings in particular to being able to see, as it were, in the spirit or hear in a way that is not just like, well, I'm called to cast out demons, so I'm going to call them out. Does that make sense? I think so. I, I think that's kind of what makes Ken and I a dynamic duo. Right. He's, he's, he's definitely prophetic. There's no doubt about it. Greatly prophetically gifted. But I would say he's probably known more for deliverance and healing. Wouldn't you? Is that fair? I would probably be known more for the prophetic. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom, um, prophecies discernment what made has any of you ever heard of a man named William Branham forget about what a lot you heard about him about towards the end of his life there were some questionable things about what he taught versus what the people around him said he taught and there were just some strange things that happened uh, so forget that set that aside for a minute let God deal with that okay I'm not saying that everything was right I'm just saying let God deal with it what made his ministry so unique is, is that he could discern whether it was just a physical sickness or it was a spirit causing the sickness. Right. Yeah. In fact, when Kenneth Hagin, I've heard allegedly, got the prophecy of Branham's death, in nine, January of 1964, Branham died in December of 65. Kenneth Hagen come under the utterance of the Holy Spirit in a restaurant and told Gordon Lindsay and a few others, I've got to get up and leave. And he went out, began to pray. I think he prayed at tongues and interpretation. And the Holy Spirit spoke through him and said, the leader, the leading prophet of the deliverance movement will be taken out of the way but his spirit will be saved. Air 66 will come, but 65, he'll not go beyond it. Something like that. Air, by the way, is an older English term. It's spelled apostrophe E-R-E, -E, and it means before. Before 66 will come. Before 66, he'll be taken out of the way, and it, that Satan would be allowed to take destroy his life um so that's what made uh, paul kane himself said that of all the voice of healing and there were over 150 of them and that voice of healing uh crossed paths with the latter rain in the 40s and 50s people like oral roberts a a allen uh, paul kane um william branham 
I mean, there were a lot of them. O.L. Jaggers. Um, there was just a lot of those great men and women of God in that time. Paul Cain said you could put all of them up on one side of a weight scale. This is his words, not mine. And Branham would stand alone by himself in a higher level than the rest of them. Now, whether or not that's true, God only knows. But what made it unique is that Branham would call out the spirit or the sickness or disease. He didn't say, now what is it that you need prayer for? He would tell them. And once you identify a spirit, you have authority over it. Just like Legion, when you get uh, the name of a demon, it's subject to you by the power of Jesus' name. So, as I said, prophetic. This is why in my book, which, shameless plug, I brought a few copies of out there. I talk. It's about the seven spirits of God. And I talk about the spirit. They're mentioned in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 3. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the spirit of counsel and might. Counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. There's three couplings there. One of those couplings is the spirit of counsel and might. The counsel, the spirit of counsel and might looks like this. Elijah, tell Naaman to go dip in a specific river a specific number of times. If he follows the counsel, the spirit of might will show up, and his body will be healed of leprosy, and he will have the flesh of a child. So the spirit of counsel... Okay, the spirit of counsel says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Tell a blind man to go find a pool. Right? Ask the blind man. He saw it all. So, <laughs> you know, that's the counsel. The spirit of might shows up. So there's something to be said of the, when the prophetic can partner with deliverance. And a lot of times healing is connected to deliverance. There are some illnesses that are just body deterioration, spirit of death. That's my opinion. But I believe a lot of sicknesses are also spiritually in nature. And if you can cast out the spirit, the body will heal. Last night when Chris was called out, he's over here now, but when he was back there, Dwight was back there and I said to Dwight, put your hand on his back. There's a spirit of death on him. And from here on the stage with no amplification, I could hear him. <laughs> I mean, it was very, and for those of you that are sitting in this section, it would have been even louder because the distance to him was closer. He was manifesting. So that was a combination of Chris got the initial word. I had a layered word that went on top of that one dealing with his spirit of death. So his was not just a conventional heart attack brought on by whatever hardening of the arteries or whatever the cause was, <clears throat> there was a spirit. And Dwight got rid of it last night so that he could live the life that he's supposed to live in fulfillment of the prophetic word that was given. So that's the kind of partnering that Chris is describing. And I don't think that says anything. It doesn't cast a shadow upon Chris at all. Okay, I, th I think we are all potentially... Because, see, our spirits have been redeemed at salvation. The only part of us that's left that is still in the process, so our soul is being sanctified. Our spirit was justified at salvation. Our soul is in the process of being sanctified by the renewing of our mind, conforming to the image of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And our bodies will be changed like the body Jesus had in his resurrection at the sounding of the last trump. What is the one part of our bodies, really there's two part, that is not yet redeemed to God? Your mind or, or your soul and your body. So if the enemy can gain access to you through your mind, through fear, doubt, pornography, whatever, or in your body, okay, there's a difference between... Um, I believe possession of your spirit versus the devil getting in your body or a demon attaching to your body or in your or the part of your mind or soul that's not yet redeemed or restored yet and none of us are fully there yet. So there's no shame in it. You understand that? We all need deliverance and freedom at times. Amen. 
All right, so um, it's just about 1 o'clock, and um, Dwight, um, you want to do 2.30? Yeah, I was going to say, let's start at 2.30 yeah. because we run a bit late, and that gives everyone time for lunch. Chris and I are going to do a book signing out there. Um, I have a book that came out in early June, and Chris, yours came out in March or April. I can't remember. Um, so if you'd like to get a signed copy of our books, uh, you can buy them. We'll sign them. And... Ultimately, he and I will go to lunch, too, which is part of why we're going to push back this start time for the afternoon uh, to 2.30. And uh, I think that's it. Yeah, might I say, I did not bring a digital card that I usually have for someone to be able to pay via debit or, or credit card. So, But I did, so you should buy my book first. Yes, you should. <laughs> okay, but the, the Seven Spirits of God, it's actually going to be on Sid Roth's TV show. Uh, I think it's either this week or the week after. Um, and I'll actually be on his social media on Thursday as well. But this book, uh, you, it's the, the, um, the soft cover, um, $15, which is cheaper than on Amazon or on Morningstar. And the hard cover is $20 if you're writing a check, Morningstar Ministries, or cash. 15 for the soft cover, 20 for the hardcover, and I'm sorry, I don't have uh, the capability for digital giving. There's ATMs you can go somewhere, all right? God bless you. Take care now. Bye-bye then. All right. Don't forget your Bible, Chris. <laughs>